Hi, I'm Larry Solon. I'd like to talk about the clinical validation study for the Oncotype DX DCIS score, which we use for patients with DCIS of the breast. As a brief background, of course, many of you know that ductal carcinoma situ, or DCIS of the breast, is a very common disease in contemporary practice. In American women, there are somewhere between 55 and 60,000 cases a year. And these patients are detected on routine screening mammography. So these are patients who come in without symptoms and on mammogram are typically found to have abnormal calcifications. And this is a very common problem in practice in the United States. Now we know that most patients in contemporary practice can be treated with breast conservation surgery or so-called lumpectomy. And we also know the adjuvant therapies such as radiation and tamoxifen reduce the risk of local recurrence. But we also know that many of these patients would not recur and we overtreat many patients to benefit the few. And what we've done in this study is to try to sort out which patients do need additional therapies and which patients do not. We also know from randomized clinical trials that radiation reduces the risk of local recurrence after a lumpectomy by about half, and tamoxifen reduces the risk even further. So again, we know that therapies work, but we don't know which patients might not recur without any treatment at all. Now in contemporary practice, most patients are treated based on their clinical and pathologic characteristics. And we know that the clinical and pathologic characteristics, while important, are also imperfect in our treatment decisions because they don't always identify patients at higher risk for recurrence after lumpectomy. And so there is really an unmet need for biologic studies based on molecular markers for patients with DCIS to try and add to clinical and pathologic parameters to improve the decision-making process. We know there are many patients with lower risk disease that could be adequately treated with surgical excision or lumpectomy alone and avoid radiation treatment. Conversely, we know there are patients at higher risk who need additional therapies. Our problem in clinical practice is that clinical and pathologic characteristics are not always um, sufficiently predictive of local recurrence for us to use these in clinical practice. And again, the need for underlying biologic and molecular markers to help us stratify risk for patients with DCIS after lumpectomy. So the DCIS score is a 12 gene panel. It's comprised of seven cancer-related genes and five reference genes. The five cancer-related genes are five proliferation genes, the PR from the hormone receptor group and GSTM1, plus again the five reference genes. These 12 genes are a subset of the 21 gene oncotype uh, DX uh, recurrence score, which we use for invasive carcinoma, but again, the 12 genes are what we use for DCIS. When we did the clinical validation study for the DCIS score, we evaluated the DCIS score in two ways, with three pre-specified risk groups of low, intermediate, and high, and we also looked at the DCIS score as a continuous variable. So in order to obtain, obtain proper level one evidence, we had to pre-specify all aspects of the analytic study for this DCIS score validation study. What we pre-specified was all of the analytic methods, all of the genes, all of the gene coefficients, and then we ran the specimens for the E5194 protocol study specimens. E5194, as you know, was a study we did in which all patients were treated with lumpectomy, no radiation was allowed, and some patients, about 30%, received adjuvant tamoxifen. And again, all the statistical analyses were pre-specified for this study. In effect, this makes this a proper validation study for a biomarker assay and is therefore in accordance with the scientific tenets as established by Simon, Paik, and Hayes. So the primary objective for this study was to determine if there was an association between the DCIS score and the risk of an ipsilateral breast event, or an IBE, also called an ipsilateral local recurrence. And again, remember, all these patients had treatment with surgical excision but without radiation. The secondary objective was also to see if the DCIS score provides value beyond standard clinical and pathologic parameters. Of course, as clinicians, we want information that helps us above and beyond clinical and pathologic pr parameters. Again, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We don't want to do an expensive molecular test unless it helps us give us information to manage our patients above and beyond what we know from clinical practice. And finally, the last objective, which was conditional, was to determine if the standard recurrence score, that is the recurrence score which we use for invasive carcinoma based on the 21 gene assay, if that recurrence score was also associated with the risk of ipsilateral breast events or IBEs. Again, the idea here was to see whether we could use the 21 gene recurrence score, the 12 gene DCIS score, 
or simply clinical and pathologic parameters. The ECOG E5194 study was used for the clinical validation. The E5194 study was a study of patients with low-risk DCIS based on clinical and pathologic characteristics, and these patients were treated with surgical excision or lumpectomy and no radiation. Towards the end of the study, about 29% or about 30% were given adjuvant tamoxifen. So again, it's important to remember that none of these patients received radiation, and they were treated with surgical excision alone based on what looked like clinical and pathologic characteristics of low-risk disease. And of the patients in the E5194 study, we were able to obtain um, tissue from 327 patients. And for these 327 patients, again, we found these patients looked to be very low risk based on their clinical and pathologic characteristics. For example, the large majority of the patients had tumors under a centimeter. They were predominantly lower intermediate grade. And the vast majority, well over 95%, were ER positive. And another important feature is that the pathologic characteristics showed that the large majority had negative margins that were very wide, predominantly five and even 10 millimeters for many or even most of these patients. So again, if one was a clinician looking at this patient in clinical practice, in clinic in real life, one would think that this was a patient at low risk for local recurrence. And these women, I believe, are representative of clinical practice. Again, these are patients who are predominantly low risk, they have small tumors under a centimeter, they're ER positive, and they have clean margins of surgical excision. Again, this is a kind of patient one might see uh, all the time uh, relatively commonly in clinical practice. So this slide is the first outcome slide from the clinical validation study. This slide shows the rate of local recurrence as a function of time out through 10 years. And it breaks out the patients according to the pre-specified risks of low, intermediate, and high. And on the panel on the left, one can see that there's a very good separation between the three groups with a very statistically significant p-value. The other critically important thing is that about 30% of the patients who look to be low risk based on clinical and pathologic characteristics actually had underlying biology that was intermediate or high risk. So again, the clinical and pathologic characteristics were insufficient to pick out patients at high risk for local recurrence and we therefore find the first piece of evidence that the underlying molecular characteristics are important to predict local recurrence for this group of patients. Now the panel on the right also shows the subset of invasive local recurrence as a function of time out through 10 years. So the difference between the two panels is that the left panel shows all local recurrences, whether invasive or DCIS, and the panel on the right shows the invasive local recurrences through 10 years. And again, we can see that using the three pre-specified risk groups of low, intermediate, and high, there's an excellent separation between the three, three curves, again, demonstrating that the underlying biology is seen and given to us by the DCIS score. Now, the curves we just saw are based on the three pre-specified risk groups of low, intermediate, and high. And what these next panels show are the predicted 10-year risk of local recurrence based on a continuous score. On the x-axis, we see the continuous score for the DCIS score. And on the y-axis, we see the predicted risk of local recurrence. And we can see here that there's a very smooth function. And as the DCIS score goes up, the predicted 10-year risk of local recurrence also rises. But the value of this curve is that for any individual patient, we can take that patient's individual DCIS tumor, we can test that tumor, and we can use these curves to predict her individual risk of local recurrence at 10 years. Now on the right, we see the same curve, but again, restricted to the subset of invasive local recurrence. And again, the difference between the two curves is on the left, it's any local recurrence, um, invasive or DCIS, and on the right, it's the subset of invasive local recurrence. And I think that both of these endpoints are important for patients in clinical practice. Patients, at least in our practice, want to know both their overall local recurrence, which is given from the left side, as well as their invasive local recurrence, which is given on the right side. And again, the power of the molecular assay is that we can then use this to predict the individual's risk based on these curves. So we then did a multivariable analysis, and of course, it's important to look at those parameters that might be valuable in addition to the DCIS score. So this panel looks at a multivariable analysis in two different ways. At the upper half, we see the multivariable analysis based on the clinical and pathologic characteristics, but excluding the DCIS score. And what one can see is that there are two variables, 
tumor size and menopausal status, which really is an indication of patient age. So again, clinical and pathologic parameters are important and they are statistically significant in the multivariable analysis. Now on the bottom, we did the multivariable analysis, but this time we included the DCIS score. And what this panel shows is that the DCIS score adds value to clinical and pathologic parameters. So we still see that clinical and pathologic parameters are important. So here we see tumor size, menopausal status, again representing age, are important, but that the DCIS score gives us underlying biology that we didn't see using our standard clinical and pathologic parameters. All of these three were, of course, statistically significant. At the bottom, you can see the other variables that were not statistically significant. Of importance for our medical oncology colleagues is the issue of tamoxifen. Now remember that this was not a randomized trial, so this trial cannot be used as evidence for or against tamoxifen. But it is actually quite interesting that the information in this trial suggested that tamoxifen was directionally consistent with the randomized clinical trials and roughly of the same magnitude. So again, it's consistent with our randomized trials, but again, shouldn't be used as evidence for or against tamoxifen. Now we were very careful to look at the grade because pathology is of course a very important parameter for DCIS patients. And we looked at grade actually three different ways. On the top left panel, we can see the grade um, as defined by the study pathologist at, at the entry into the study. That is the local pathologist from the institution where the case was entered. And we can see that grading one, two, and three made no difference or was not statistically associated in this group of patients with local recurrence. Now it's important to remember that these patients are predominantly low risk patients. On the top right, we see David Page's grading. So there was a central pathology review done by the late David Page. And again, using his criteria, we see that there was no difference in local recurrence based on those uh, pathologic grading. And finally, at the bottom left, we see current CAP guidelines. That is the pathology guidelines that your pathologist hopefully is using in clinical practice. And again, we see that there is no difference in local recurrence based on that. It's important when looking at the issue about grading and pathology to remember that all these patients had relatively low risk disease. So these findings really will apply to this group of patients in E5194 who had low risk disease based on clinical and pathologic characteristics. Now the next slide shows a scatter plot. And what this does, it shows the distribution of the DCIS scores for the individual patients. And what one can see is that there's a wide range of distribution of DCIS scores, regardless of whether one has high grade, intermediate, or low grade disease. And that's actually important because again, it suggests that the DCIS score gives us underlying biology that we don't see using contemporary grading criteria. We also looked at a number of other pathologic characteristics, for example, architectural pattern and common necrosis. And again, we saw a wide range of distribution of the DCIS scores. And again, for any individual pattern or common necrosis score or underlying grade, we saw a wide distribution. Again, what this suggests is that the DCIS score gives us important information above and beyond our standard clinical and pathologic characteristics. So in summary, it's important to recognize that the E5194 is a proper validation study for the DCIS score. And it does give us a predictor for local recurrence, both for any local recurrence or any IBE, as well as for the subset of invasive local recurrence. So the second conclusion is that the DCIS score quantifies the local recurrence risk, both for any local recurrence as well as for invasive local recurrence. And this is very important in clinical practice because we can use the patient's individual tumor to obtain her individual score and get her predicted risk for local recurrence and invasive local recurrence. So our third conclusion is that the DCIS score provides independent information above and beyond clinical and pathologic characteristics. And this is very important because for the individual patient, we get additional information that we don't see when we see that patient in clinical practice. And so our final conclusion is that the DCIS score gives us additional information for managing our patients with newly diagnosed DCIS of the breast that we can use in clinical practice after that patient has had a lumpectomy or surgical excision of the DCIS tumor. So here's how we might use the DCIS score in clinical practice. So this particular patient is in her late 50s, she's 58, she has a grade two DCIS, it's ER positive, it's seven millimeters, and it's excised with clean margins. This is the kind of patient we would like not to give radiation, but again, we don't know the underlying tumor biology. 
So this is a patient where we order a DCIS score, and based on the DCIS score and her individual predicted risk of local recurrence, we can make better decisions about whether to add radiation after lumpectomy. So if we take this patient and we send a DCIS score, and her DCIS score comes back very low risk, her risk of local recurrence is under 10%, and her risk of invasive local recurrence is only about 3 or 4%. And this is a patient one might feel very comfortable not adding radiation to. Conversely, if she comes back with an intermediate or a high DCIS score, her risk of local recurrence and invasive local recurrence can be substantial, perhaps in the 20% range for local recurrence and the 10% range for invasive local recurrence. And this is a patient where we might feel very comfortable offering treatment with radiotherapy. So again, this is how we can use the DCIS score in clinical practice to help guide us with treatments after surgical excision.